Kulu Seguin Duroyaye, an agronomist with over six years professional experience in plant and animal production, and Dr. Ganesh Cheraparambil, a chartered economic policy analyst, spoke to our Thrive community about how we can solve the issues of poverty and hunger. Their talks were part of October's SDG 1 and 2 theme, creating a world with no poverty and zero hunger. After their presentations, our speakers kindly took questions from our audience. Hi everyone, hope you're all doing well. Kimish, uh, so there's a question for you. Uh, can it be said that globalization has indeed helped in reducing food insecurity, according to your research? So obviously when I take uh, globalization, uh, it obviously had a three phases, if you look back from the history itself. So globalization has helped improving and developing economies. Now, that by itself do have forced this uh, food supply chain improvement and sharing within the economies. And obviously, if you look at uh, quite many economies, there were happenings like instead of the oil, some countries which were rich in agriculture has shared food grains and accumulated oil. So this sort of transactions have happened. And one of the major reasons is basically because of the globalization. So my take is this, obviously globalization has helped, but to a larger extent, if you say the geopolitics, when it comes into the play for uh, protectionism or the economic advantage for e eco each economy, there are some bad sides which has come into play. Otherwise, by and large, globalization, I even propose that the globalization is needed for uh, the equal development of economies, yes. So my take is it has supported, yes. Yeah, even I would say so, because it has improved our, the way the food is being provided to the world. Um, development in agricultural practices, seeds, etc. Biotechnology has flourished and thanks to globalization. So I think uh, it can be credited by and large for reducing the food insecurity. India is one of the best examples for that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but India, in, in my mind, India was one of the uh, things which is exchange of crude and wheat, yeah. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Um, there's another question that has come up for Oli Sukun. Um, so if you could answer that in the chat section or in the question and answer, that would be great. Um, so considering the recent natural calamities, could you please provide insights on the latest techniques to combat natural disasters? Okay, I'm just about to answer the first question. I'm typing it now. Perfect, perfect. So once you've typed it in, then I can read that out. So everyone can listen to that. So um, in the meanwhile, can I ask you another question, Ganesh, if that's okay? Yeah, sure. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so one of the members from the audience has requested um, if you could elaborate on how gender enhancement and absence of liberalization help with reducing poverty. Uh, so there are two dimensions for this question. One is the gender enhan enhancement and the liberalization. Yeah. Uh, now I start with the gender enhancement. Now in India, the basic study they have done, uh, I don't remember exactly the name of the paper. I, th I think in the reference that might be. Now in that paper, they have done the study on a general enhancement, some Agrawal and Anjay Agrawal, somebody has done the study. And what he has done is, he has done, uh, especially with the low income class, he studied the families and how this income has been distributed or how the income goes into it. So when he studied that dimension, he came across as something like uh, when women manage the family, especially the expenses have cut down and probably because of uh, some of the ways which he mentions is alcohol or drugs and the gambling in a different forms. So these are the other expenses which comes into the family. When the women handle this, these things doesn't come into the family. So that is how the gender enhancement in that way 
giving power to the women or an equal power sharing within the family where uh, male domination has to be given away and both are equal in that way if money is being handled within the family there is an enhancement which is happening and that is a study which is being happened which has happened and it is being published so probably i can share that paper might be with uh, the moderator later after this that is one now the second about uh, the liberalization i am not a proponent saying that the capitalism is actually good there are problems with the capitalism now by and large if you look at the capitalist economies which are existing you will see that very less amount of poverty is being seen in most of the countries which do have the capitalism and where they don't expect the government to act on their needs basically so that is the difference which is happening in the liberalized economy or a capitalist economy but in a developing economy everything people expect from the government to do it so that is where in a capitalist economy where poverty is not seen as a market failure but in developing economies they see poverty as a market failure because the government has to do it and the poverty exists because of quite many factors now i am absolutely agreeing that there are problems which has happened because of some of the countries or might be because of the political parties and all the stuff but by and large given the political ideologies liberalism seems to be or the capitalism seems to be much advanced in that way that is my take on that so i am saying not the abs yeah absence of liberalism in all those poor countries i mean is that clear i hope so yeah, um, yeah. yeah. so the member is listening to the question uh, to the answer and i hope um, they are happy to know about it yeah uh, thanks kanish um just waiting if there's anyone who would put up a question for any of our speakers that'll be great and um, uh, i have a question that i like to ask so i'll share this one uh we'll circulate in the others uh on the subject of uh UBI, Universal Basic Income. Uh, what are your thoughts around that, uh, uh, Ganesh, and how it could be uh, a useful tool at a policy level? And uh, maybe you can refer to where some attempts have been made in implementing something along these lines in various parts around the world. So a little bit about uh, Universal Basic Income. Uh, so where the Universal Basic Income has implemented in China to some extent in a different form, and it seems to be rather successful because the accessibility to the data on that dimension is comparatively much lower but it seems to be working comparatively rather good and there was a blog which is being written on a thrive blog now quite many countries where most of the time when they give the welfare programs from the welfare program or let's say unemployment benefits are given now they are trying to bring individuals back to workforce if you have seen that there is a massive resignation in a job that was which was happening in this 2022 there are quite many news which is happening so the unemployment benefits which are being given they do have a problem like the wages has to go beyond the unemployment benefit for the people to act or work or being part of the workforce now they have introduced uh, you might be over there for a few months or things like that unless and until you have the reason you can't resign there is no unemployment benefits so the government has to correct the individuals to get back into a role so that is uh, something which is happening with the quite many welfare programs which are happening so that is where they thought about the universal basic income on the basis of the income individuals uh, which seems to be compared to have the other programs seems to be better one now once it is being implemented there could be an unintended consequences which can come up but by and large it seems to be a better option given so that is what i think about uh, this universal basic income all right uh, thanks for that uh... I have a, a few more questions here, but Devanshi, do you have yeah. some there or would you like me to proceed? Yeah, sure. It would be awesome if you could proceed, Maurice. Thanks. 
All right, no worries then. I believe uh, Olu Seguin is uh, sending answers through and uh, just so everyone knows here, uh, we usually get far more questions that we can answer in the time allocated. And we do take those questions offline and pass them on to our presenters who then provide answers. And then we share them as part of our uh, write-up for the uh, webinar. So everyone here in this group uh, can access these. I'll provide further instructions later how you can get your answers. So if you still have questions, even though we're running short of time, do share it in the chat because our speakers will be able to answer those for you. Uh, one of the questions I have here is relating to uh, uh, eradicating uh, poverty uh, worldwide. Um, so, uh, you know, many people work uh, to, to address this sort of type of issues. Now, some of, some of the things that people do may be even um, out of their personal conviction um, and may not be so easy to comprehend uh, rationally in doing uh, the things that they do. But the question is uh, whether you think that the world needs uh, to have more empathy, I guess, towards a more uh, you know, sort of rational approach uh, as opposed to what we're doing up till now. Uh, what's your thoughts on, on that, uh, Ganesh? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Maurice, for that, that question. Because um, when the UN says about the poverty, uh, I mean, at the current juncture, they speak about giving charity. So quite many often when it comes to in terms of the charity, it is, it is more of an emotional approach than the rational dimension. So it should be speaking about something like an empathy dimension to the society. Now, when we read, it's quite often that when we read today, even I read in Sudan in a might be in a month's time, there could be one lakh people who could be struck by poverty because of this inflation. It's a few months. So when we read, yes, we are emotionally taken up. Now, it, when it gets into act, sometimes when people do act, they, it may not make a, any sort of rational sense from an economic point of view or a success rate when you look at the... <laughs> personal success in the society, it may not make any sense for that. So basically it is more empathy dimension or it has to go beyond the rational dimensions of individuals. So basically most of the emotional dimensions doesn't have quite many rational definitions or rational answers. So for sure the poverty, yes, there are rational theories and the rational dimensions like the welfare program, policies which are being implemented, but the selfless service of quite many individuals, look at the developing economies. There are quite many individuals in the communities in the society by itself who are doing, might be very small community doing something for uh, the individuals over there. So there are quite many, even in India, I have seen quite many people who are doing that. They are actually the selfless service. So that is required. I think it goes beyond the rational dimensions. Rational is of course when it comes to the institutional level, but otherwise individuals, it has to go beyond that. That is what I personally feel and I believe that. Right, thanks for that, uh, Ganesh. Uh, I have actually a response here from a question that was asked of Ulu Seguin uh, just a little earlier. Uh, I'll voice it uh, uh, for the benefit of everyone here. Uh, so it was asked about uh, solutions around increasing food uh, availability and so forth. So he says here, the solution lies in increasing food availability, food access and food adequacy for all. Uh, he says governments have to increase agricultural production. Uh, that's number one. Number two, he says, enhance science and technology deployment in agricultural or agricultural production. And thirdly, he says here, have adequate uh, storage facility. Uh, perhaps if he was able to voice, he might have elaborated a bit on this, but this sort of gives you an insight into uh, what uh, he sees as the answer. As I said, we will be resharing these questions and the full version of the answers, plus uh, the questions that we won't be able to uh, get answers for this evening, but these will be shared in the follow-up uh, uh, from the webinar and uh, details on that uh, coming. Um, 
let's see, there's a question that's come in uh, for Ganesh. Um, last question that we'll wrap up after this, I think. Uh, in the USA, poverty is rampant and it is considered a developed economy. Uh, how uh, to reach uh, a balance between government handouts in a socialized economy and the liberal capitalism you refer to that may create sources of income through work. So uh, just um, uh, last question uh, to be taken. Uh, I remind everyone in the chat that there is a survey. Please make sure to follow through with that. Uh, very useful for us to have a good understanding of the sort of topics you like to uh, be covered in, in future webinars. Uh, over to you, Ganesh, with that question. Uh, yeah, uh, I'll take up that uh, question. And I'm not uh, that uh, what uh, known or uh, have not know that the US economy to a larger extent from a different economic indicators, but by and large, I can say one thing. If you go back in the history of the mercantilism, which speaks about once the country grows higher and higher, there is a possibility of people becoming um, lazy to work. So that is the problem of the welfare programs which have run. Now, I don't know whether any studies which have done on how this poverty within the economy has gone higher. Now, everywhere we speak about uh, the gap between the rich and the poor and the inequalities and the extent of uh, this drug use within the economies also as the drug cartel and its operations also have gone higher. Now, these dimensions do play a role in that, I do believe especially the drug and uh, the people lethargic to going to work because of the welfare program. Now, its effect can be a bit higher in those economies. Now, why I take liberalism to a larger extent is compared to all the poverty-stricken economies, it is comparatively very, very lower, but it is growing over there. And probably some sort of measure has to be taken by the government to correct it in the form of producing either, uh, let's say, these welfare programs or given like a UBI, universal basic income, with a certain criteria. So that is what I think could be the answer for that. 